Good evening. The 43rd meeting of the 22nd Council will come to order. All councillors are present this evening. We'll start with a moment of silence, and we have a scout troop we'll come on down uh, to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to introduce the scouts from Troop 3 at Emanuel Presbyterian in Knob Hill to lead us in the pledge this evening. Gentlemen, welcome. Get us started. Pledge to allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, guys. Civic Plaza parking passes are available for members of the public. You can obtain a parking pass from the council staff at the sign-up table. Council will take a break at approximately 7 p.m. this evening. We will get started with a proclamation by Councilor Sanchez. Thank you, Mr. President. At this time, I would like the uh, family of Maria Colunia Segura Metziger to please stand and be acknowledged. Tonight, the birthday girl could not be present, but we've got many of the family members here. And at this time, I would like to invite up um, Anthony Segura, along with Victor, and also Mrs. Segura's, Metzger's children, Edwina Guterres, David Segura, and Tilly King. And with her is the entire family. We'd like everybody to come forward and just stand behind the family. And you're all invited over to the house on the 23rd of October for the big birthday bash. Welcome everyone. And the proclamation reads, whereas Maria Colunia Segura Metziger was born on October 23rd of 1907 in Domingo, a former New Mexico territory near Santa Fe, New Mexico, and is fluent in both English and Spanish. And whereas Maria Colunia Segura Metziger is the daughter of Damien and Fidela Dimas Sandoval and had five brothers, Refugio, Leo, Manuel, Damien, and Orlando, along with four sisters, Margaret Garcia, Ramona Baca, Alice Gonzalez, and Lena Garcia, and whereas Mrs. Segura Metziger's sister, Margaret Garcia, passed away three months before her 100th birthday on March 31st of 2013, but still has three of her siblings all in their 90s, Ramona 98, Alice 93, and Damien 90, and whereas Mrs. Segura Metziger has been described as New Mexico's treasure, as a treasure to her family as she married Grandpa Victor Segura in 1925, who passed away in 1940 due to an accident, and later married David Metziger in 1959. And whereas Mrs. Segura Metziger had seven children, three of whom passed away as babies, the other four, Edwina Guterres, 91, Dolores Alona, 89, David Segura, 86, and Tilly King, 81, will be able to celebrate their mother's birthday with her and whereas Mrs. Segura Metziger is the matriarch of six generations, as she has 16 grandchildren, 36 great-grandchildren, 57 great-great-grandchildren, and three great-great-great-grandchildren. And whereas Mrs. Segura uh, Metziger is unofficially the oldest Facebook user, and in, <laughs> <laughs> and in 2012, Mrs. Segura Metziger and her family had trouble creating a Facebook account, as Facebook would not allow anybody to register at only up to the age of 101. At the time, she was 104 years old. <laughs> and whereas Mrs. Segura Metzger was featured in the documentary, Distressed Persons Coping with Stress, as she overcame oh. cancer in 1992 and a broken hip at the age of 100, though at that time doctors said she had the heart of a 60-year-old person. And whereas Mrs. Segura Metzger started life riding a covered wagon and went on to ride in a jet 
to the Holy Land in 1995. And whereas Mrs. Segura Metzger's favorite song is Bendito, and still sings My Country Tisithi with extreme pride, and whereas Mrs. Segura Metzger attributes her longevity to eating chili and beans as well as her Catholic faith, be it proclaimed that the council, the governing body of the city of Albuquerque, hereby wishes Maria Colunia Segura Metziger a very happy 110th birthday. I believe uh, Victor and Anthony are going to say a few words along with some of the family members. Council President Benton, distinguished counselors, Councilor Sanchez, I want to thank you on behalf of my family for honoring our grandmother. This was all Ca Councilor Sanchez's idea. It wasn't our idea. So I want to thank you, Councilor Sanchez, for doing this. Of course, she do did vote for you, you know, so. <laughs> well, she was my youngest supporter. <laughs> she was. She was. On a, but we are honored to, to have our grandmother basically honored here by the council in the city of Albuquerque. I wish she could have been here today. Unfortunately, uh, she is bedridden right now as well as, as one of her daughters, Dolores, who's not able to make it. But I brought my little cousin here to represent, that's his mother, and he's gonna represent when we go up and accept the proclamation. On behalf of the Metziker Segura family, and my grandmother, again, we wanna thank everyone for honoring our grandmother. And we also have a video of her this evening. Uh, the, it was on Mother's Day, I went over to the house to collect $5 contributions to get signatures because I was up for re-election. And uh, she sang uh, God Bless America. And I think uh, our policy analyst, Elaine's got that set up. I'm trying to get it going to send the connection a little weaker right now, but we are working on it right now. It's waiting. Okay, that's Elaine hiding back there behind yes. the computer. <laughs> Would any of the family members like to make a couple of comments? Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, all of you, for, uh, for this evening. And uh, we all are very proud, very glad, mucho orgullo for our mother, grandmother, great, great, great grandmother. We'll accept uh, the proclamation with pride. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And he's one of the youngest in the family. He's only 86 years old. <laughs> Are we ready, Elaine? Yes, sir. She is. Yes, sir. She is. Yes, sir. She is. Okay, we've got it on. Again, we wish your mom, your grandmother, a very, very happy birthday this coming October 23rd, 110 years old. What a remarkable life that she's lived, and look at the uh, offspring and of all the wonderful family members. Thank you very much for being here. And you can all come up and receive the one proclamation, but we'd like you to come up and... <laughs>
Smart. <laughs> May the next 110 years be as good as the first 110. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. All right, next is uh, our economic development discussion. We have no discussion tonight. The next item on the agenda will be the administration question and answer period. <laughs> Counselors, any questions for the administration? Seeing none, we'll move on. Uh, Vice President Winter. Thank you, Mr. President. I move approval of the October 4th journal. There's a motion and a second for the approval of the October 4th journal. All those in favor say yes. Yes. Opposed? That passes. Uh, we'll move to communications and introductions. Mr. President. Are there uh, I'd like to go back to one question for the administration. Uh, okay, Councilor Sanchez. Uh, thank you, Ms. Perry. Do we have any plans in place? I know that we are going to be changing uh, administrations real soon uh, regarding the issues regarding the uh, Department of Justice and the settlement agreement. Do we have a transition period now in place to be dealing with these issues? Uh, Ms. Ms. President, Councilor Sanchez, I believe the city attorney is probably best uh, suited to answer that question. but. Um, I believe that that's going to be a situation that will probably um, have to receive heavy transitional briefing um, after the runoff election. Um, right now, th those, those issues are legal issues, and there's um, duties of confidentiality and the like that are involved. And so uh, we will, I think legal actually already did do transition, but when those issues came up, um, it, it was basically relayed that uh, we're planning a great deal more intense briefing on that uh, once the runoff election and a mayor elect and uh, the associated team, including legal counsel, is appointed for the transition. Thank you. Counselors, are there any changes to the letter of introduction? I have one. I'll move the rules be suspended for the purpose of placing R248 on tonight uh, tonight's agenda for final action, R248 is concerning the municipal runoff election to be held at the city on Tuesday, November 14, 2017, and making a contingent appropriation of funds for the runoff election. This will require two-thirds of vote of the councilors present. All those in favor say yes. Yes. Opposed? And that passes. Vice President Wiener. Thank you, Mr. President. I move approval of the letter of introduction. There's a motion and a second for approval of the letter of introduction. All those in favor say yes. Yes. Opposed? And that passes. Uh, we'll move to reports of committees. The Internal Operations Committee met on, on Monday, October 4th, and approved and reports out the following items and corresponding dollar amounts be approved. $30,000 for Downtown Arts and Cultural District, $20,000 for the Flamenco $20,000 for Opera Southwest, Bless Me Ultima Phase Two. $20,000 for Tender Love Community Center. $8,000 for Friends of Public Art. $20,000 for Trick Lock Revolutions. $12,000 for Steps. $20,000 for Vortex. $25,000 for Warehouse 508. $4,000 for uh, Mid-Rio Council of Government's Freight Investment Community Committee. $4,000 for Mañana de Oro. 
$3,000 for the Special Needs Advisory Council. I move to accept the Internal Operations Committee report. Second. There's a motion and a second. All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? And that passes. Councilor Davis. Thank you, Mr. President. The Finance and Government Operations Committee met on Monday, October 9th and reports out the following items. In the matter of EC's 415, 416, 417, 418, 419, 421, 422, 428, 435, 436, and 444, that they be approved. In the matter of EC's 423, 424, 426, 427, 429, OC 33, and 34, that receipt be noted. In the matter of O55, R236, 244, 245, and 246, that they do pass. In the matter of EC 420, that it be approved and acted on at the meeting at which is reported, being this one. In the matter of R216 and 235, that they do pass and be acted on at the meeting at which they are reported. In the matter of R242, 243, that they be without recommendation as substituted. Finally, in the matter of 058, that it do pass as substituted. I make a motion to accept this report. There's a motion and a second to the, accept the FGO report. All those in favor say yes. yes. Opposed? That passes. Councilor Jones. Thank you, Mr. President. The Land Use Planning and Zoning Committee met on Wednesday, October 11th, 2017, and reports out the following items. In the matter of O49, that it be without recommendation as substituted and as amended, and be heard at the meeting in which it is reported out. In the matter of R213, that it be without recommendation as substituted, and be heard at the meeting in which it is reported. In the matter of R240, that it be without recommendation as substituted, and be heard at the meeting in which it is reported. I make a motion to accept the committee report. Second. There's a motion and a second to accept the Land Use Planning and Zoning Committee report. All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? That passes. We'll move to deferrals and withdrawals. Councilors, any deferrals or withdrawals at this time? Councilor Harris. Thank you, Mr. President. I move a deferral of FSR 177, which is directing the city administration to evaluate the performance of the Albuquerque Rapid Transit Project as it impacts traffic along Central Avenue. I move a deferral to November 20th. There is a motion and a second for a deferral until November 20th on floor substitute R-177. All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? And that passes. We'll move to the consent agenda. Are there any changes to the consent agenda? Um, I would like to pull item B, that's EC-17-443 from the consent agenda. Second. There's a, uh, and uh, that doesn't require a, a second, however, thank you. <laughs> um, so uh, with that, uh, Vice President Winter. Thank you, Mr. President. I move approval of the consent agenda. Second. There's a motion and a second for approval of the consent agenda. All those in favor say yes. Yes. Opposed? That passes. Um, so we'll go to uh, item B, EC 17-443. The mayor's recommendation of Wilson and Company Incorporated Engineers and Architects for on-call traffic operations. Um, and uh, Mr. Ma uh, Mr. Manicucci, I think you were going to address this question that, uh, that I requested be pulled. Yes, Mr. President, counselors. Uh this AC will actually begin to uh, begin again engineer in place to begin working on the NTMP process. However, um, the NTMP process, many of the projects oftentimes end up involving the constituent policy analysts or the counselors because they are very somewhat sensitive and important to neighborhoods. So my recommendation is, is that we just pull it out and defer this contract and just ask that if the DMD people and if the counselor and if the um, engineering firm would come in and just meet with a group of counselors, one or two counselors and one or two policy analysts to just kind of just let the, get a briefing on what, you know, the issues are as they arrive through council, uh, some of the sensitivities of the neighborhoods, uh, some of the needs for some creative um, uh, recommendations at times, and just kind of get the feeling from, you know, how the firm would be up to uh, addressing these issues and, and meeting these challenges. It would just be staff's, council staff's recommendation in this matter before proceeding with approving the contract. Councilors, uh, thank you, thank you, Tom. Um, I do think this is important that we make sure that we, as as individuals and as a body, are comfortable going forward with this process. 
we, we did approve uh, capital funding, or which, which if the voter, or well, the voters did approve capital funding uh, for this program, uh, correct, Mr. Manicucci? Um, I guess I'll have to look, yeah, we'll have to look up, we know for sure that almost always council set aside projects are what pay for the projects, which is another reason we feel council should have a quick review at how the engineering firm would perform. Uh, We're gonna have to look up the 2019 to see if we have any NTMP funds in it. I thought I saw a line item for this. Are you shaking your head? You're nodding your head, thank you. Uh, Acting Director Lozoya indicates that's a correct. They, they, they do, uh, they did, I think, have a fairly robust line item. Um, and that line item, as I understand it, would cover the engineering aspects. We still, uh, you know, as projects develop through the Neighborhood Traffic Management Program, we still have to find capital funding in many cases uh, for them. Uh, but uh, but I think this is, you know, making sure we're all together on how this is going to occur going forward, I do think makes some sense. So um, do you have a recommendation, uh, Mr. Manicucci, on how long a deferral we would need on this? Um, I guess it depends on how quickly the counselors feel like they should get together. I was thinking 30 days because it just gives time for the engineering firm to assemble and for the counselors to decide. We'd like to see if we can get possibly one or two counselors and one or two policy analysts in the rooms. And so with everybody's schedule being busy, that would kind of give time for us to get a meeting together that for a couple hours. Okay, thank you, Mr. Manicucci. Um, so I'll move a, a deferral until the uh, second meeting in November, but Mr. Reardon uh, has a comment. Mr. President, counselors, if I could, th these type of selections take months and months. This is, this is, I'm not sure on this one, but they usually take about four months to get to you. Um, and then about six months to get through this process of selection. So this, this is a company that's know they've been awarded a project for some time now, have to ramp up with employees to start working. This, this effort that Tom wants to go through can, can easily be done after we have them under contract. So I, I would sincerely appreciate it on their behalf, on our behalf, to have a consultant on board that can actually respond to neighborhood traffic management programs. These, these selections, again, we have to advertise for a month. We have to do a, go through a selection committee that's well vetted. It goes to the mayor's office, then ultimately it comes here. It's gone through subcommittee without this request for deferral. Um, th this is a company that has done a, a significant amount of work for us, and, and we, uh, we should be able to treat them properly and make sure that our consultants can keep working. So. Uh, I, I don't disagree with what Tom wants to do, but it, it's, it's something that can be simply done after we award the contract. So I'd, I'd appreciate your diligence in moving this along uh, without a deferral. Okay, well, um, you know, I, I, I think it's worth uh, kind of lighting, lighting a fire under assault to have this meeting. So I'm gonna change that motion to uh, the first, to our next meeting. Okay. And, uh, and, and Mr. Minicucci, let's, let's try to get that set up and okay. so that we can conduct that meeting and know exactly where we're going when we vote on it next okay. time if the council agrees with my motion. So is there a second? There's a motion and a second for deferral of, uh, of uh, the item, item B, EC 17-443 until our next council meeting. All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? And that passes. Vice President Winter. Yeah, thank you, um, Mr. President. Move for approval of the consent agenda. There's, there's a motion second for approval of the consent agenda as modified. We oh, already, oh, we, we did, this. did that. I'm sorry. We did. My bad. Okay. We All right, we're done with that. Okay, so, so that item uh, was pulled. We'll now go to general public comments, and there will be a two minute time limit for your comment. The light on the podium will be green for the first minute and a half, then the bell will ring, light will turn yellow, indicating you have 30 seconds remaining to wrap up your comments. At two minutes, the light will turn red and ring to indicate your time is up. Um, we will uh, get started. Uh, we'll read uh, the, the names of the three people who are next in line. So we'll start with uh, Don Schrader, followed by Robert Nelson, followed by E. Ward. I would be ashamed to watch a football game. I would be ashamed as hell to enjoy watching men brutally injure each other's knees, shoulders, elbows, necks, brains. Many former football players suffer from concussions. They suffer severe headaches, Alzheimer's, depression, 
dementia, alcoholism, other drug addiction, suicide, violence toward family and friends. The donated brains of 110 out of 111 dead former NFL players suffered serious brain damage. Is encouraging boys and men to play football less harmful than addicting them to cigarettes, booze, or cocaine? I compliment African American and other football players who conscientiously refuse to stand for the national anthem. I compliment them for protesting racial injustice. I compliment them for publicly opposing Trump, who was endorsed by the Ku Klux Klan and many white supremacists. Sadly, football fans cheer players injuring each other, but many fans damn those players who demonstrate freedom of speech. Hell no to football and all violent sports. Yes to healthy bodies and exercise. Yes to conscience and freedom of speech. Yes to affectionate body pleasure and romance men with men. Next is Mr. Nelson. Uh, no applause, please. This is not a session for applause. This is uh, just public comment. Decorum needs to be maintained. Uh, Mr. Nelson, Ms. Ward, and then Lynn Anderson. Well, good evening, counselors, President Council Benton. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. My name is Robert Nelson. And I'm on the board for Wells Park Neighbor Association and a member of the Historic Neighborhoods Alliance. Wells Park wishes to reiterate its continued opposition for the IDO, the Integrated Development Ordinance, wishing it deferred so that equitable engagement can occur with communities of color, like our neighbors in Santa Barbara, Martinez Town, and Sawmill. As a member of the HNA, we continue to advocate for the equitable engagement of communities of color. For too long, these communities have been subjected to the priorities of economic development at the hands of city officials and wealthy developers. That the IDO has done at the service of capital, thus displacing cultures and multitudes of families, all the while being told it's good for us and good for Albuquerque. The IDO has been an equitable process since the beginning. There was not adequate representation of our diverse community throughout the planning process. And to reiterate, over 65% of the planning participants were white, non-Hispanic. Less than 15% were Hispanic, Chicano, or Latino, and only 1% were Native American. In a community where there is, where there is a rising majority, these types of public process, projects need input from all of its community members, not just those who are white. And rather than spending more money on Spanish-speaking ads and meetings, our city, city, our city misses a key distinction in public engagement that sufficient outreach does not equal cultural effective engagement. And rather than chalking up to apathy of our neighbors, our city should be asking why people do not show up to public meetings in the first place. That would be an inequitable practice. That would be an equitable practice and a change in mindset from scarcity to asset. And the truth is, so communities of color are not seen as assets in, our assets in our community. We are seen as a burden and a barrier to economic development. And yet, we have so much to invest in our traditions and our history and our culture. We ask that the process of the IDO slow down, be deferred, indefinitely so that our community can give culturally effective input and that we want community assessments conducted with neighborhoods before approval of the document and not two years after its approval. Thank you and have a good evening. Next is uh, E. Ward, followed by Lynn Anderson. Uh, continue at outbursts, uh, people will be removed from the audience. Uh, e. Ward, Lynn Anderson, and Michael Steinberg. Crystal.
Councilors, good evening, Mr. President. You have heard and will continue to hear that this ABZ to Z project has been rushed without adequate time for scrutiny of the comprehensive plan and now the proposed 657 page IDO. Well, it turns out a project team leader agreed with us. In February 2015, Ms. Rents Whit um, Whitmore had to put the brakes on Councillor Jones, who wanted to vote on the comp plan update. I'll read her sentence. A year was already ambitious and pushing the public process into hurry mode. And even when the project staff and council staff were facing criticism for the fast turnaround time with barely any time for review of the changes of the EPC findings and changes to the LUPS hearing, Councillor Jones was not pleased that there were any delays and didn't want any further ones. And now we get into the IDO process, but I want to remind you that at the council hearings, the full council hearings for the comprehensive plan, Councillors Harris and Councillors Davis spoke about where the attention would be paid. We'll spend our time. The IDO is where we're going to spend our time. And yet what happened at the last LUPS hearing, the, the document was moved forward to full council for immediate action. That's not spending adequate time to scrutinize the myriad changes and significant amendments that were la added at the last LUPS uh, that face tremendous public backlash. Thank you. Next speaker is Lynn Anderson, followed by Michael Steinberg and then Camille Verroz. President Benton, Count City Councilors, my name is Lynn Anderson. I represent NAOP the Commercial Real Estate Development Association. I'm here tonight to tell you that um, uh, the quote, or the, uh, the vote on the board of NAOP was unanimous in support of this uh, IDO finally appearing before you. It's been over three years. I remember the first time, um, the first meeting on the comp plan, I was there at uh, the convention center, and the, um, the consultant who spoke, who uh, s basically stated that after reviewing our process, in the 75 some odd cities that he had consulted with, Albuquerque had the worst development process of any he had ever seen. What you've done is had a long and very complex and very involved and very open and transparent attempt to make all these changes that will make this a simpler process for everyone involved. Simpler and more understandable and without the need for a lot of um, uh, uh, trials or um, meetings at EPC that are arguing over language, that are arguing over conflicting sector plans, that are unsure what the, um, the, co the uh, particular property uh, definitions are. So I am very pleased tonight to see what's happening here. And I commend you for the work that's gone into it. And I commend the staff for all the work that they have done. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Mr. Steinberg, followed by Ms. Veroz, followed by Roger Fenzel. Thank you. Hello, my name is Michael Steinberg. I'm the president of Asuna Trading and Loan of North Valley Pawn Shop for 35 years now. My son is also in my business, hopefully taking over so I can retire. My family has lived in Albuquerque since 1963. And my main concern is everything about the way the pawnbroker's bill 0-50 was presented is very upsetting. This bill could put me and my employees out of business. I only heard about this bill from the media. We are an industry that were never approached by Councilor Gibson or APD. The gold buyers told me they met with Councilor Gibson and APD. I never heard about committee meetings. So we, th we could have discussed the bill. We are a very small business. We have no fancy lawyers to help us. We were never approached by anyone on the council until recently. I definitely thank Councillor Benton and Lewis for all the help they've given me recently. I feel we are being treated as the bad guys. Albuquerque has definitely a crime problem. There's only 18 real pawn shops in Albuquerque. I am president of 16 of them in our association. We report to APD daily. 
A real quick statistic. Our 16 stores last year, I checked with everyone, would do about 250,000 pawns and loans, in loans and buys a year. APD has taken at the most 150 items out of 250,000. Why pick on us? We're already regulated highly. Bad guys do not come in and give us their IDs and sell stolen goods. They know better. Our stores pay taxes, have employees, pay rent and property taxes like anyone else. There's only 18 of us. We are not the scourge of Albuquerque. Again, no one's ever asked us anything. Mayor Chavez had me on committees that mess to discuss gang problems, run down properties, transients, and more. We communicated for the good of the city. There's even a deputy chief I could call for city or pawn issues. And right now, we have nobody. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Ms. Veroz, followed by Roger Finzel, followed by Tess Conti. Good evening. Um, I'm Camille Vados, and I'm a 68-year resident of the North Valley. This first picture is an example of a, an intense density living complex, which is in the 4th Street Corridor Plan and zoned in the IDO Plan. Um, this first part is phase one. This second picture represents, to the west, is phase two. Uh, you can see that it's out of compliance with the elevation. This is on the west back end of this intense density living complex. Uh, there is not enough parking. This consists of 69 units. And where's the parking for these 69 units? That doesn't take into consideration the commercial parking uh, in the front of this complex. This is the neighborhood to the west of this complex. Um, if a goal of the Fourth Street Corridor Plan, comp plans throughout the city, or the IDO is to not change or impact um, the character of the neighborhoods, how could you say differently? Thank you. Thank you. Next is Mr. Fenzel followed by Tess Conti, followed by Connie Schroeder. Thank you, counselors. My name is Roger Finzel. I'm a retired criminal defense attorney. I'm a lifelong Democrat from working class family union members in Detroit, Michigan. It wasn't easy for me to get a law degree, and there were times when I didn't have money. I'm speaking on behalf of patrons of the pawn shops, and I'm speaking now and later as well, but now I want to address yourselves to the title of the bill and the caption as it reads, as it is provided as notice to the public, which says, amending the city of Albuquerque Code of Ordinances, the pawnbrokers or ordinance, semicolon, adding provisions for certain buyers of precious metals and gems. That does not provide adequate notice to a person of ordinary intelligence that the bill goes far beyond that, will wipe out the pawnbroker business in this city, and will deny the opportunity for people to get a short-term loan. I'm speaking about the young mother who, not getting a living wage, which has not been provided for by this council or the state, um, goes into a pawn shop to pawn her radio because she needs to buy diapers. That young mother cannot wait three days to change her child's diapers. And you're not going to pay for the pawn for three days. That's just one of the many things that are wrong about this bill. 
and I'm speaking now to the fact that you have not provided adequate notice to the public, they don't know what's in this bill, and you shouldn't be going forward with a bill that doesn't provide notice, and there is ample opportunity. You've got lots of room to put in a full description of the bill uh, if you wanted to. Mr. I wonder Schreiber. why it's not there. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Lewis. Sir, sir, do you mind if I ask you a question real quick? And, yeah, thank you. Really appreciate you coming down. I just, I wanted to uh, just get an idea of if, if this is, uh, you know, when you found out about this bill, if you've been involved in any kind of discussion on policy uh, with, the, uh, with the council, the administration. Um, I, I found out about this bill from pawnbrokers who I know. I'm a patron of pawn shops. I go to pawn shops to buy, I'm a military collector of rifles. I go there to buy the rifles because only at pawn shops do they do a, back, a check to make sure the gun isn't stolen. When I get a gun at a pawn shop as opposed to any other place, that gun is not stolen. And I heard about it from the pawnbrokers. And I only heard about it over the weekend that it was actually going to be on the agenda today. So I, I don't think we're providing adequate notice to the rest of the public. Thank you for asking me. Uh, no, I appreciate it. And I think um, that sometimes there's this misconception about, about the majority of the work that, uh, uh, or the business that happens with pawnbrokers, which, uh, which is pawning. I mean, people come and they pawn their you know, items and, and uh, it's, it's, it remains the private property of, uh, of the person who, uh, who pawns that. And so are there, uh, you know, and those are some of the problems that I have. And I know that that bit have caused great concern among the pawn, you know, pawn brokers, some of those misconceptions. But uh, what, are your, what are your thoughts on that as far well, as? Well, very briefly, it's my understanding that 85 to 90% of the items that are pawned are redeemed. The pawn brokers don't want the items. They're there to provide a service for a reasonable return given the expenses that they have. So most people come there for a short-term loan. You've got a date, you don't have enough money, you bring your tools in, you get a $25 loan, you come back in a week after you get paid, and you, you've, you've fulfilled that. They don't have credit cards, they can't go to a bank, and they're certainly not gonna go to a payday loan or other places like, or a title loan because the interest is exorbitant. So what happens with this bill and what you're not providing notice on is that the people who depend on pawn shops for those small loans, the 250,000 transactions that Mr. Steinberg uh, mentioned, those people are gonna be wiped out. They won't be able to get those small loans. Thank you, sir. Thank you for asking, sir. All right, next uh, speaker is uh, Ms. Conti, followed by Connie Schroeder and Peter, uh, I think it's Bilan. Good evening, counselors. Um, my name is Tess Conti. I've owned Rocky Mountain Gold and Silver Exchange in Albuquerque for 28 years. Um, I'm here basically to speak about the same ordinance. Um, we've had the opportunity to meet with Councillor Gibson. Um, I felt like we did make some progress in there and we will have further negotiation with her and the police. Um, our standing is basically the same thing. Some of our clients are the poorest people in this city and they come in and they literally will sell $10 worth of gold or silver to be able to put gas in their car or $50 to be able to buy groceries for their families. And they can't wait three days and have a check mailed to them. So it would be actually longer than three days. Um, not to mention it would devastate our businesses. It would put a lot of good, honest, hardworking business people out of business. I know it would really decimate my business and I have expressed that to Councillor Gibson and the police, but I am hopeful that we can come to some sort of resolution with further negotiation. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Gibson. Thank you, I'm, I'm glad you came down to, uh, for public, public comment. I just wanna um, reassure you that this bill is by no means finished. I simply wanted to uh, keep the bill on the agenda just to uh, give it a, a chance for public comment, uh, for some de debate and discussion within council, but uh, we're, we s we'll still be working with you, it's not finished. 
There will be more changes to come, I'm sure. So, but I appreciate you coming down. Thank you. And, and it, it is an important point that just because we have something on the agenda or if we move something for immediate action, part of the intention uh, of that usually is to have the full council debate the, the bill. It may or may not be acted upon, but, but that's oftentimes the intention and it's oftentimes misunderstood. Councilor Lewis. Mr. President, thank you. And I know we're gonna discuss this bill here a little bit later, but I'm, I'm wondering if, um, if, you know, if, if there's some way that we could, maybe the, the, uh, the, the Small Business Commission uh, might be a good way to, um, to have this, com that have this uh, discussion also, or some way to formalize um, the stakeholders you know, that are involved in this. I think what happens is when you have, when you have a bill that, that uh, you know, goes through our process, that has such an effect on, uh, on many of the business owners in our city, as well as, you know, clearly as well as families and, and those that are in, in great need in our city. I'm, I'm wondering if there's a way that we could formalize um, a process um, that includes the stakeholders, uh, that would include APD, um, to, to, to really have a discussion on the kind of bill that would, because I think the, intent, the, the intentions, of course, are, are, are correct um, with wanting uh, to be able to, um, uh, you know, to be able to deal with some of the, uh, some of the, some of the challenges, some of the crime issues, and that uh, that I think is, is how this bill is intended. Um, but I, you know, and, and we could certainly discuss this when the bill comes up. But I wonder, you know, if we could have a good discussion, and maybe our staff could, you know, think of a possibility of a kind of a structure of, of being able to formalize a way to be able to ensure that these stakeholders are involved in any kind of. Um, you know, bill like this that would that would drastically affect their businesses. All right, thank you, Mr. President. Thank. You. Next is uh, speaker is Connie Schroeder, followed by Peter Bilan, followed by Rudolph Serrano. When you hear your name, there are seats up front for you to come sit and be ready to speak. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today. My name is Lonnie Schroeder. Lonnie, and, uh, sorry. Um, Lonnie's Custom Jewelers in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and I, I wanted to thank Councilors Gibson, Davis, and Lewis for uh, meeting with us and giving us an ear uh, earlier in these, these past few weeks. Uh, really appreciate being a part of the process of tuning this bill and look forward to um, assisting in any way to, to get a, gain the Council gain a better understanding of how this bill will affect fine jewelry stores in Albuquerque. And uh, looking forward to that, uh, that opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next is uh, Mr. Bilan, followed by Rudolph Serrano, and then John Garcia. Uh, thank you, council members. Um, my name is Peter Bilan. I own Albuquerque Coins. It's been open for almost 40 years. Next year it'll be 40 years. I'm the third owner. Um, it's my dream job. I grew up here in town. I really, really, I found my little niche. I love it. And this bill just keeps me up at night, that I couldn't pay anyone with cash for something that is obviously theirs. Perhaps it's something I've sold to them as a collector. Um, you know, uh, yeah, I've been broken into three times this year. Uh, crime is a, it's out of control. It's crazy right now. Um, we all want to help. Anything we can do to help, I, any detective who comes in, any policeman, I would show them anything they, you know, any purchase ticket I've written up, any, anything I might still have in the hold, yeah, I'm, I'm more than willing to help. Um, the, the not paying cash thing, I, I wonder if that's even constitutional on a federal level. Um, mailing a check in, in three days to their driver's license address, what if they moved? What if they're from out of state? I, I deal with uh, people coming in to settle the states all the time, and um, that's a concern. I'm going to fingerprint everyone, and APD's backed up 6,000 sets of fingerprints, and this is going to help by adding uh, another 100 a month a day if we include everyone who's fingerprinting. The ca the, this castle wide net, it's just treating everyone as a criminal. and. And, and that's and um, it needs to be a more elegant bill. And I know everyone that does come to speak tonight is more than willing to sit down and talk with anyone. If any of you would like to come in and see my store, I'd, I'd love to have you. I can walk you through a, a purchase, a typical purchase, what a typical coin collection looks like. And um, I thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Bylan. And I have a question. 
Yes, sir. Sorry for mispronouncing your name earlier. No. Um, so could you describe just briefly the, the current uh, reporting requirement of what you report to uh, the police department on, on uh, items that come in? Is there uh, one? Uh, currently, there, there is no reporting to APD. I do, when I purchase something, obviously you get a driver's license, a uh, inventory description of goods, um, and then you, you kind of weed out the people that it, when they come in and they, they say their grandmother has just given them a one carat ring at, with a diamond, you know, 18 carat. No, I don't think she did. That really doesn't seem like something that happened. And you just politely decline and say it's not something I'd be interested in buying. But no, 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 I, I hold everything for at least a week, usually two, because I'm a one-man show and I get way backed up. Um, but as the law is written now, there, there isn't um, any way to report things to APD that have been purchased. I, if, if you want me to start faxing stuff, give me a phone number. I'll fax those over tomorrow morning. I'll go back two weeks. All so. right. So uh, you're, you're sometimes called by APD in search of a particular item? Or? Not for years. I've had okay. more cops in my store recently uh, investigating crimes against me versus looking for anything. Councilor Lewis? And, and you, you may not have experienced that, but the, you know, the APD does have the ability, I mean, as you know, I know you know this, um, to be able to, if something's, if something's pawned and you're holding on to it, you actually put it in a sealed envelope and uh, and it would be, you know, if it's uh, if it's if it's if the police officer wants to look at it, they're oh. able to open it up, uh, actually put a note in there, and so that there's a record that it was it was looked at in that way. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I mean, I, I, but I think if you tell us, you know, because I think that's that's and it'd be a good discussion we'll have later too when we talk about this bill. But what what are the few things in this bill that you understand that would be the the just an unacceptable change that would put the kind of burden on you all that you think would just fundamentally change your business um as the bill was written there was a clause where every item had to be photographed and a coin collection of literally thousands of items i i have bought collections of thousands of items and um a, a printed photo of each item maintained for two years that's just printering that's just staples getting rich on that one um, the, uh, again, and the, the not paying, being able to pay cash, you know, you want me to write a check for $25 for a single silver dollar, mail it to somebody in three days, day and a half to get there, uh, just people would walk and uh, people would walk and they would put these things on Facebook marketplace. They would put them on Craigslist and somebody would end up getting hurt. Someone would meet somebody in a parking lot or even in, you know, a, a restaurant or somewhere and they would get mugged or followed home, and we've all seen you know, how crime has escalated in the city, and I, it is kind of a safety issue, I it, believe. Have, have you been involved in any of the discussion regarding this bill as far as how it should be shaped or, or sharing some of those concerns about it? I didn't know a thing about this bill until I saw something in the newspaper uh, about a month ago, and then I had no idea it was on the agenda for tonight until I woke up at 3.30 this morning to check my store cameras, and I saw it on KOB's website. Yeah, no, I, I will sit down anytime, anywhere to, to give any input I possibly can. I would be more than happy to. Thanks for taking the time to come down here tonight. Thank you, sir. Councilor Davis, then Councilor Gibson. Anyone? Yes. Okay, Councilor Gibson. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Bellin. Uh, is it Billin? Bylin. Bylin, I'm All sorry. And, and you did come out for the coffee. Yes, oh, ma'am. I don't know, a few months ago. So we had talked about it. I believe, sir, that, and, and you're not a pawn, you don't operate under a pawn shop license, right? No, no. Okay, I not believe, at least the way it's written now, is that I don't believe that this would even affect you. The initial draft that I read, it sure seemed that, you know, I guess okay, I- Okay, so I, let me explain. Let me just say that, that the, the way this is written, unless you're melting down, do you, and I don't think you melt down any of your coins, do you? Oh, occasionally, yes. Things oh, you will do? come in okay. that- that I, I'm are sorry, mutilated I or unsellable, and they go yeah. to a refiner. Well, maybe you, maybe you and I and staff can sit down and, you know, try to figure out uh, about how you're running your business, how it works, and <clears throat> excuse me, maybe, um, maybe how you could report in into the Leeds database or some other way. 
I'm, we're more than willing to help. Okay. My, I have an assistant over there somewhere. He could take your card if you would, right. or leave it in the desk with the staff. Thank you. Uh, ne next speaker is Rudolph Serrano, followed by John Garcia, followed by Sal Perdomo. Uh, President Benton and uh, members of the, the council, uh, good evening. Uh, and it seems like uh, the issue is crime and how we're going to get crime and how can we sort who is the good people and who is the bad people because some, some of these criminals own pawn shops and some of they don't. They're just honest people that really are coming out of the nothing and making their business. So I think that we can agree and uh, just keep them forward and trying to see who is who. Um, and, uh, so that's what I think because, I mean, closing the pound shop is not going to finish, you know, the crime, the crime. Because they'll, they'll go to the Mexican market, they'll send them to Mexico, or, or they'll figure out, you know, send them to another uh, town. You know, they, they're always going to find out to keep on making their money. So we, we have to make sure we don't affect our businesses by doing that. Another place that we need to sort more is, is, is in bonding, you know, and, and, and we're having a lot of issues with what's going on in the bonding world and the, with the judges, and, and I came to share a little bit in the dark side of bonding. Primo Cop, because this used to be a small town, now we're turning into a big city, but in the old days, the Primo Cop arrests you and takes you to jail, and the Primo Bondsman checks how money you got, he tells the judge, and the primo judge tells the primo, uh, the primo lawyer, you know how much to charge you. And it goes further. If you have a nice house, they keep you 90 days until they take your house. That's the way it used to work. It was a whole mob, you know? And, uh, and that's what we have to consider. You know, there's some innocent people in there that have constitutional rights, like me. You know, they, they brought me from, uh, from Miami. My mom gave $100 to my son, and I was uh, stalking the mom. Mm -hmm. I was not even here. And thank God I won the case, and, uh, but the federal government won't defend me. That's, those are bad judges, <laughs> you know, but uh, all state judges are doing their best. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Garcia, then Mr. Perdomo, then Bianca Encinias. <clears throat> Mr. President, members of the council, my name is John Garcia, Executive Vice President of the Home Builders Association of Central New Mexico, and I'd like to thank uh, Director Lubar, Planning Staff, LUPS Committee, Council Staff, and you, City Councilors, uh, for the effort to revise the City's Development Ordinance, also known as the Integrated Development Ordinance, and encourage you to move forward with, with adoption of the IDEA with amendments. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Mr. Perdomo, then Bianca Encinias, then Ed Carler. Good evening, counselors. My name is Sal Perdomo. I'm with, I'm with Titan Development. I'm here to speak in support of the Integrated Development Ordinance. I'd first like, like to thank you, your staff, and the planning department um, for your efforts in getting the IDO to where it is today. It's come a long way. In its current form, we do not believe the IDO is perfect, but we are in full support and believe it is evident that it is approved with no further delays. The IDEO will positively impact the health and economic vitality of our city. It will preserve our culturally sensitive communities while also making Albuquerque a place that is pro-growth. It will help attract and retain talented individuals and economic base employers. And it will create an environment where millennials like myself want to live. The IDEO is not perfect, but it should be approved and it should not be delayed any further. Um, we just, uh, I just read through the new amendments that um, come forth uh, A through D, and uh, they don't, they don't, I don't see any major problems with them. I'm not really in full support of uh, Amendment B, but I think it's not a deal breaker by any means. Um, I'd also like to thank Councillor Davis for working um, to get uh, LUP's Amendment D um, changed. Um, and then in conclusion, I'd like to ask for your full support for the Integrated Development Ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Ms. Encinias, then Ed Carler, then Charlie Carl. Good evening. Thank you, counselors, for allowing us to speak tonight. My name is Bianca Encinias, and I'm with the Historical Neighborhood Alliance. I'm a business owner, and I'll, I've worked in the field of community development and economic development for 17 years. At the end of the day, I'm a New Mexican, and I'd just like to thank Counselor Sanchez for inspiring me tonight and reminding me of 
why I'm here. My grandmothers, my grandmothers were ranchers, they were farmers, they were business owners, and they were landowners. And what they taught me is that we have a right to be involved in the decision making regarding our property. And I'm here to say to say that the public process was inequitable. The public participation process for the IDL has failed to be inclusive of minorities and provide equal voice in the process of democracy, as shown by the city's own data. Based on the city's own data, the participation of minorities in the development and vision of the IDO was well below their representation in terms of population. From 1,115 polled attendees at these planning meetings, 79% of the respondents were white, non-Hispanic. Only 15% were Hispanic. That, if you compare that to our population as a Chicana, we make up 48% of the population in Bernalillo County. Millennial participation throughout the planning process was also problematic. At a meeting held on March 25th, 31st at Tractor Brewing, of the 39 attendees, 74% were white, non-Hispanic, 15 were Hispanic, and 0% for Native American, which I find shocking. Yet, the Hispanic millennial population is 50% of the population in this country and the largest majority in Bernalillo County. All this data shows that the city planners and consultants implemented a public outreach plan that was culturally insignificant and ineffective. Let's not perpetuate the history and racism and land use and planning and the land theft that occurred in this state. Let's set a better example. We encourage you today to defer the IDO until the new administration comes in and we're able to properly notify property owners through their tax assessment bill. Thank you very Thank you. much. Next is Ed Car Carter or Carler followed by Charlie Carler, Carler or Carter, can't read the writing, and then Tad Nemiski. It's uh, Carler, K-A-R-L-A-R. -E okay, thank you. Sorry. My name's Ed Carler and I own ABQ Gold and Silver Exchange. I'm here to talk about the pawnbroker's ordinance, uh, I believe it's 1750. Um, I don't wanna reiterate everything that you've already heard from several people, I think there's a different angle that you might want to look at is the unintended consequences of the of the bill if it passes um, it's not hard for any of us to uh, have foresight as far as the consequences of hiring more officers it can't be bad um, how about keeping criminals in jail more longer than 24 hours you know there's really no bad you know, consequences to that. Uh, but when you go to uh, pass something like this, not really understanding the ordinance or the, or the, or the uh, uh, information that's in it, um, you know, my family's been in New Mexico since 1945, and we've owned several businesses, you know, over the years. And uh, you really have to think about what you're doing before you do it because you're going to put a lot of people out of business you're going to create a lot of problems i just think the real issue here is not the pawnbrokers or the gold and silver buyers because the crime has already been committed when it gets to us and i think enforcement is the real issue we need to get more officers on the street that's obvious uh, because that's how you'll stop it uh, you have to keep the criminals in jail longer you know, uh, be you know more more strict on them. Uh, you know, coming to us and putting tax-paying businesses uh, and putting a burden on them uh, is really not the answer. I think it's the the ordinance, the that we, the bill that, or the law that we have in effect now. It works. It works. If you have if you have enforcement. Thank you. Next is uh, Charlie Carler followed by Tad Nemiski. Good evening, I'm Charlie Carler. I'm owner and operator of Southwestern Gold in Albuquerque since 1971. And I'm here on the uh, Brokers <coughs> ordinance and the, the uh, addition that you wanna add to that. I have a hard time asking someone who I've done business with 40 years or more, I sold him the coins uh, for his fingerprint 
to, to, to consummate this, this transaction. And then after we're done with it, uh, waiting three days to mail him a check, when I know that he's an honest person, when I know the origin of these coins, um, I, I don't think this bill makes allowances for the honest people. I think it, I think it cloaks everybody under a criminal aspect of it. And I think that's very unfair. Um, uh, my clientele are, are, are basically older people um, and honest, and I just don't think that, you know, it wouldn't give them that consideration. Uh, and frankly, I don't think they would do it. I think they would be insulted and walk out. And uh, my hands are going to be tied because of this. And it would really put a, a huge burden on my business uh, as far as satisfying my clients' needs. Thank you for your time. Next is Ted Nemiski, followed by Mr. Hill, Dave Hill, followed by Mike Contreras, I believe. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Ted Nemiski. I have something said to say. Well, last Saturday, very early in the morning, actually, it means seven and eight. Elderly woman, person, woman got killed crossing 40 miles an hour street, Wyoming. This is public safety. Yes, I, I outlive and I'm still living to this day. Her dying, we try to save her life. It is a big, very serious issue. Well, Central and Wyoming, Wyoming and Central, that's what I'm talking. Louisiana and Central, San Mateo and Central. That's what is problem. You, you can reduce on, San Mateo, on Central, but still remain on San Mateo and all Louisiana and Wyoming. Also, design community centers, senior centers and libraries. They don't belong along the Central Avenue. They do not. They belong in residential areas, inside. Accessible to the elderly people who can walk to those centers. I'm sorry that's sad, but you got, you spending all this money, our money, our money, spend it wisely. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, next is Mr. Hill, followed by, I believe it's Mike Contreras, followed by Loretta Naranjo Lopez. Mr. President and council members, my name is Dave Hill. I'm with Myasis Award. I am a commercial real estate broker. I am here to encourage you to pass the IDO as passed through LUPS. I've uh, been at this process for over two years. It has been an open and encompassing process. I commend the staff and the council for taking on this task, and it's something that the city needs desperately. There's two reasons why I'm going to ask you to uh, pass this proposal. First of all, it brings predictability to the process both for those that are against development and those that are for development. It brings a predictable path for development or a predictable path to stopping the development. Second, it protects existing neighborhoods. This ordinance preserves the existing neighborhoods and the nature of our neighborhoods, and that's one of the reasons that I back this proposal. So, tonight, I encourage you to pass the IDO and send it on. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is, is Mike, followed by Nor Loretta Naranjo Lopez, followed by Simon Polakowski. Council President, uh, members of the City Council, uh, my name is Mike Contreras, Sentinel, Sentinel Real Estate and Investment, and uh, I encourage you to approve the IDO. Uh, the document isn't perfect, but I think uh, there's uh, mechanisms within the document to uh, make corrections over uh, that it will be needed. And uh, 
You know, I've attended many meetings, hearings over the years uh, for this, um, for the IDO, and uh, I think the city really needs it. Um, we uh, desperately need jobs in our community, and I think this would uh, definitely help us in that direction. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Mr. Anjo Lopez, followed by Mr. Polakowski, followed by Kathleen Nunn. Good evening, Chair, um, Councilors. The Santa Barbara Martinez, well, my name is Loretta Naranjo Lopez, and I represent and am president of the Santa Barbara Martinez Town Neighborhood Association and Martinez Town Work Group with Albuquerque Interfaith, and also a leader with this Dark Neighborhood Alliance. And we continue to request denial of the integrated development ordinance. The associations just met two Fridays ago to discuss with Councillor Benton and staff in regards to the character protection overlay. The CPO should have been discussed extensively with the associations in the neighborhood prior to EPC's meetings. Martinez Town Santa Barbara continues to be treated differently and the zone categories proposed is to promote displacement for our neighborhood. Um, the R1 zoning should have been addressed in 2009 with Site Southwest and the community, and the R1 is a permissive use in the R2 zone and should be allowed in the predominant residential area of Santa Barbara Martinez Town. The proposed IDO is not consistent with the health, safety, and welfare of the residents, and there will be no stability with the proposed apartment commercial zoning and many of the proposed zoning will be harmful to the property owners in Santa Barbara Martinez Town. And I will refer to the appeals and slash protests that we provided uh, with the Stark Neighborhood Alliance and the Santa Barbara Martinez Town Neighborhood Association that should have been pr provided in your packet. Uh, we again, we continue to request denial. We were told from the time we started meeting with the staff that we had to meet with our counselor. So here we are at the last minute wondering what our character protection overlay looks like and what our zone is gonna look like. And I think uh, the process was not meant to support our, our residents and the, the historic neighborhood alliance. Followed by Kathleen Nunn and then Renee Horvath. Uh, good evening, counselors. I represent no one but myself. Uh, prior to the council meeting, I saw someone who had been here many times, a few times before, and I asked her how much commercial TV or media exposure uh, the, she had gotten, the, the problem that she's come down here to discuss has gotten. She said that somebody in the neighborhood association was on a 30 second spot on TV once. And, uh, you know, that's just not enough for people to be informed about what's going on in the communities in Albuquerque. Uh, when we had community television, people could present, like many people here, in 58 minutes what they believe was very important to their community, and there would be discussion on programs uh, that were web streamed live over the Internet. Uh, people come down here two minutes and they say they're not informed. Where was GovTV informing the public? Where was public access? Were they informing the public? Were they engaging the public? Asking them, please come down, bring your stories to us and we'll broadcast them for you. Uh, these people have this little podium right here for two minutes and it seems to be just before a vote. Uh, that's not enough. Uh, Pawnbrokers. Again, uh, people that no one knew about this. Uh, this is terrible. This is terrible. At the last minute, things are decided upon without any real input from all the people concerned, which is the whole community. Uh, something has to be done. This can't be by chance that I was looking at KOB, I was looking at the city website, that I was finally informed by this. How come I didn't know about this till it was too late? Thank you. Next speaker is Kathleen Nunn, followed by Renee Horvath. Good evening and thank you. I'm a resident of Albuquerque since 1950. 
In the absence of action by the federal government and concern with the high crime rate in Albuquerque, I urge the city council to create and enact a citizen's protection ordinance that includes the following regulations. Number one, bump stocks, illegal to sell, purchase, own, or use. Number two, all gun sale, show sales require a background check. Three, no advertisements for private gun sales allowed in local print media. Number four, armor piercing ammunition illegal to sell, purchase, own, or use. Five, silencers illegal to sell, purchase, own, or use. Six, high capacity magazines limited to six rounds. Seven, assault weapons illegal to sell, purchase, own, or use. The crime needs to stop in this city, and it's your job to do it. Thank you. Thank Mr. you, Ms. President. Nunn. Ms. Nunn? Ms. Nunn. Uh, Councillor Davis has a question. Ms. Nunn, thanks for coming down to bring this up. It's a conversation we've had several times over the last few years since mm -hmm. I've been a city councillor. Um, and I, I might ask that you help us amend your request and with folks to help us. Uh, as you may be aware, the state constitution says that only the state legislature can regulate gun issues, and so the city council doesn't have the authority um, to enact those requests that you have. But we do have the authority later this year to adopt requests that, uh, to our state legislators for legislation that we would support, mm -hmm. and I encourage you to organize folks to mm -hmm. work with us to include those types of recommendations for bills uh, to the legislature in our lobbying uh, request that comes later in the year. I think you could impact the legislature if the city council, as a group, ask for these kinds of rules. Absolutely. <laughs> we'll have that debate, and I hope you'll continue to bring those to us. Thank you. Um, and I, I think uh, Councillor Gibson did bring the, that exact uh, uh, idea, but, but we did not get it out of committee. I, I supported it, but we were on the losing side. Um, all right, uh, next speaker and last speaker under general public comment is Renee Horvath. Uh, hello, I'm, my name is Renee Horvath. I'm with the Taylor Ranch Neighborhood Association. Uh, I wanted to speak on the IDOs uh, for general comments. Uh, many times through this process, I've heard comments many times that the IDO, because of the densities that you're promoting, will help stop the Santa Lina from uh, sprawling out. But I've been to many of those hearings, and the county has approved it. And yes, we should be concerned because they did approve a TIDS with it, and we should be concerned about it and how much it's going to cost the taxpayers money to do the infrastructure outside their property and doing road improvements. But the one thing I do want to bring up in regards to the IDO is that many times uh, when you give uh, all these land entitlements in terms of densities or building heights or setbacks or reduced parking requirements, uh, it tends to raise the land values. And we should be looking at that because once you give out entitlements such as that, and that kind of, uh, and the value of the land goes up and becomes more expensive, a lot of times development looks elsewhere for cheaper land to build on. And so this could encourage more development out in outlying areas like Rio Rancho or the Santa Lina, and we should be considering that and think about this. I know that uh, Jolene has sent in a letter early on in the process asking that an economic impact analysis be done in looking at how will this impact Albuquerque's economic future if the land prices go too high and we start seeing people move out to the outskirts. So I wanted to raise that issue with you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll move to announcements. Councillor Pena. Thank you, Mr. President. There will be an Albuquerque Bernalillo County Water Utility Authority meeting on Wednesday, October 18th at 5 p.m. in the Vincent E. Grego Chambers. Thank you. There will also be an Albuquerque Bernalillo County Government Commission meeting on Thursday, October 26th at 5 p.m. in the Vincent E. Griego Chambers. We'll move on now to public hearings. Um, we have uh, two items under public hearings, uh, AC 177 
They're both on the same development project in AC 17A. And Mr. Melendres will explain both of the, of the appeals. Uh, we'll, we'll vote on them separately, but he will explain both of them at this time. Thank you, Mr. President. Council, um, as you correctly stated, Council President, AC 17 and AC 17.7 and 17.8 are related appeals. They both apply to the same property um, where a rezoning was approved by the Environmental Planning Commission to rezone property from M1 and R1 to C2 and R2. The property is approximately 20 acres and generally situated at the northeast corner of Rio Grande Boulevard and Interstate 40. The existing zoning on the site has been in place uh, since 1957 was the last time a zone map amendment occurred. Um, the site is bound by the interstate to the south, commercial to the west, high density residential to the east. The EPC approved the ZMA based on changed conditions in the area um, and also based on its advancement of land use policies in the comprehensive plan relating to infill, mixed use, land use transitioning, access to infrastructure, and proximity to major transportation corridors. The North Valley Coalition and Ms. Darlene Amanaya both appealed the decision of the EPC, which resulted in the two separate appeals that are before you. The City Council referred those appeals to its land use hearing officer, who recommends that the appeals be denied and that the EPC's decision uh, to approve the ZMA be upheld. Essentially, the LUHO went through the appeals and identified that the EPC handled them appropriately with respect to the justification under uh, R270-1980 required for zone map amendments, um, identifying the existing zoning is essentially inappropriate because it's a match of R1 to M1 right up against each other, which does not provide a good land use transition, and the proposed zoning of C2 and R2 would help remedy that and provide some buffering to the R1 situated to the north. Uh, the, EP the LUHO also evaluated the EPC's review of consistency with land use policies, and as I've stated, found consistency uh, with the majority of policies in the area relating to this central urban area uh, and this infill project. Also, with respect to impacts, traffic was a major discussion with respect to this proposed project, um, and the LUHO identified in the traffic analysis that the, uh, this proposed ZMA would actually yield a lesser traffic impact as compared to build out of the existing zoning and accordingly uh, determined that traffic Im uh, impacts were not a determinative factor justifying denial of the zone map amendment. Tonight, you won't hear from the parties. Um, you will only consider whether to accept or reject the re recommendation of the land use hearing officer. If you have any questions, I'll try to answer those from the record. If you feel like you need more information or more process on this, um, you could vote to reject the land use hearing officer's recommendation, in which case we would have a full hearing at our next meeting. Councilor Lewis, then Councilor Gibson. Mr. President, I know we'll have some <coughs> discussion, but I, I want to move to accept the LUHO recommendations and findings. Second. There's a motion and a second to accept the recommendations and findings of the LUHO. Uh, Councilor Gibson, did you, uh, was that all you had? Uh, so there is a motion and a second for acceptance of, of uh, the LUHO's finding and recommendations, which, which would mean that uh, uh, the EPC's decision would stand uh, and that um, or the EPC's recommendation would stand and that we would not hear uh, the appeals. Correct, Mr. Melinda? Mr. President, that's correct. And if I could just get uh, Councilor Lewis, the movement, to clarify that the uh, motion is for AC 17-7, and then we'll need a separate motion for AC 17-8 okay. since they're related. All right, so so we'll 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 continue debate on both, but we do have a motion now on item A, AC 17-7. Um, I and, and encourage anyone else to speak, but I do have some questions of my own. Um, the uh, in reading the the record and the Luho. Um, I wanted to be clear, Mr. Melendres, on the appellant's uh, issues. And I, I understand that they include uh, uh, an argument that the R270 1980 was not complied with. Could, look, I'll just go with these in order unless others have questions. Could you explain what that argument was? Sure, Mr. President. Um, Essentially, 
There are a couple of bases for justification under R270-1980. One relates to uh, furtherance of policies within the comp plan or other related plans, and the other relates to um, uh, changed conditions or a mistake in the original zoning. The EPC in this particular instance determined that uh, the changed conditions in the area, which include the development of Interstate 40, um, which did not exist when this property was originally rezoned, um, was a changed condition in the area. Also, uh, the Dudanis Sector Development Plan was developed in the interim and rezoned some property immediately along Rio Grande Boulevard to commercial, uh, which had an impact on this particular site. Um, the appellants are arguing uh, related to policies, the Lujo characterized um, that a lot of their policy arguments related to design of the site, and so design aspects will come into play because of the size of the site and the commercial rezoning. There will have to be a site plan reviewed by the Environmental Planning Commission when the subject site is ultimately designed, but the, the majority of those policies that are uh, of concern as raised in the appeal related to site design issues. Um, some additional policies that were raised uh, out of the Dudanis Sector Development Plan um, the Lujo identified as the Dudanis Sector Development Plan not applying to this particular property. It sits just outside of the Sector Development Plan. So um, while the appellants were arguing issues with respect to those policies, the Lujo identified essentially that they didn't apply at this time or that they didn't apply because they weren't applicable, applicable to this particular property. Um, that was the, the large basis of the uh, issues that the appellants had. Um, with respect to change conditions, the LUHO did determine that um, sufficient changes had occurred in the area since 1957 to justify a rezoning and to put this transition phase type zoning in place of the M1-R1 combination. So, um, if you would speak a little closer into the mic, Mr. Melendres, when you answer this, because I'm getting old and losing my hearing. Um, the, uh, so, on, on the change conditions, was there, so, so what I heard was, first of all, the Duranis sector plan, this is one of the, the arguments that was made by the appellant, that the Duranis sector plan having, having zoned adjacent uh, land, which is not part of, of this, and, and just to be clear, am I correct that this is not part of the Duranis sector plan? Mr. President, that is correct. So that plan, which, Council, I think some of us were, were on that council when that was approved. Um, that zoned the, the parcels along Rio Grande Boulevard to, to a C1 equivalent, roughly. Mr. President, um, some of that rezoning, as reflected in the record and analysis of the LUHO, is more consistent with C2, C2, and some of it is more consistent with C1, so it's a bit of a mix along Rio Grande. All right, so, so it was C1 and C2. Uh, adjoining the property, but I think the north, the the uh, the southern part of it was C2. Correct. Okay, and then uh, with regard to these design, uh, what you describe as a design issues, um, how does that relate to? Um, Mr. President, to there was R a two seventy nineteen eighty. Excuse me. Sure, Mr. President. Um, R270-1980 calls for an evaluation of whether or not uh, the zone proposal will be um, in significant um, inconsistency with the comprehensive plan or area plans. And um, some of the, the design issues that were raised um, related to the way that the site plan would be laid out, the way that um, the Alameda drain and Campbell ditch that are in the area would be impacted. And so those um, particular issues uh, were identified as being part of a subsequent consideration, but with respect to the zoning policy consideration, um, this particular site is in the central urban area as identified by the comprehensive plan. Um, it's partially within an area of consistency and partially within an area of change as identified by the uh, recent amendments to the comprehensive plan. And those are the policies that the EPC and the LUHO identified as supporting the proposed zone map amendment. And so these transportation issues, which, which uh, I think they've been publicly described as well as in the, in the case, um, primarily have to do with congestion, correct, uh, on Rio Grande Boulevard, the present and future maybe aggravated uh, congestion on Rio Grande Boulevard in the area of, 
of I-40. Mr. President, that's correct. The, the site is situated along uh, major transportation corridors, obviously the interstate and Rio Grande Boulevard, which has a designation as a, a transit corridor uh, up to the freeway and then a multimodal corridor on the north side of the freeway. Um, the record does indicate um, that the area is congested and in, in performing um, at a relatively poor level of service presently at, at Rio Grande and I-40. Um, however, even under the existing zoning where somebody could come in and pull a building permit tomorrow, that traffic impact, according to the study, would exacerbate the problem more than the proposed zone map amendment. So essentially any development at the site will contribute. Um, uh, uh, the proposed zone map amendment would not contribute more than what exists today. So the, the traffic study was, was conducted by the, uh, the applicant? Mr. President, correct. Mr. President, that's correct. Um, the traffic study was not required as part of the zone map amendment. Um, however, uh, drafts were prepared and reviewed um, that, that yielded these results, and those were prepared by the applicant um, relating to, to address the, the traffic issues that were being raised. All right, um, and I, you know, we're fact that Rio Grande Boulevard and this, this interchange is in the district is something that I'm well aware of and I just want to you know, be clear to counsel and to the public that, that I have been working on issues with that roadway including meetings with, with the Department of Transportation on, who, which uh, controls the, the, uh, the interchange itself and the on-ramps and off-ramps and that uh, this, is a, this is a problematic uh, interchange but but what you're telling me is that that the uh, that the traffic study indicated that that under the present zoning uh, uh, it would exacerbate it even further if it were to be developed under the present zoning mr. president that's correct okay um, anybody else want to I, I, I did have uh, one other question about about this unless counselors counselor Sanchez Oh, yes, thank you, Mr. President. This is a very unique situation. I mean, we've got now zoning that is M1 and R1, and they're looking at changing that zoning to, I think, it's C2 and R2. And because of that, you know, I don't think in the years that I have served, I've seen a case that has come before the council where you've got multiple different zoning in different areas that's being changed into, into C2 and, and into uh, R2 right now, it, it just, uh, you know, I think that there should be a full hearing on this and I wouldn't be ready to move forward right now on this particular issue because I just think it's unique. And I think, you know, the, uh, the appellant should have their case heard before this full council because of the complexity of this issue. And I would like to see a full hearing before we, you know, vote on this uh, issue this evening because of that. And as uh, Councilor Ben, you stated uh, regarding the traffic issues, you know, is it going to be worse or is it going to be better? I know it's been a problem for some time now, and I just think we need to look at this very carefully and, and then make that decision. But I think all parties should be involved in a full hearing uh, before this council, before we make a final decision. And, and the motion understood, uh, Councilor Sanchez, the motion on the table now, of course, is, Correct. is, exactly. is not that. But I, I did want to just follow up, uh, and then any other counselors, please jump in. Um, so with regard to these traffic engineering issues, if you will, um, uh, access, and I know there have been discussions about other access possibilities and, and concerns on the site. Um, are these, are these uh, normally addressed through the zone change uh, process as opposed to, let me back up. My understanding is this site at least the C2 portion as proposed would be subject to an EPC hearing. Mr. President, that is correct. Okay. And um, do you know off the top of your head, uh, the gen in terms of the trip generation, is that mostly from the C2 or, or from the, the uh, R2? Um, Mr. President, the, the traffic impact considers all of the land uses on the site, which would include Combined. the proposed R2. Um, a component of the site would remain R1, so it's not part of the zone change, but it would remain R1 and develop with R1 uses at the far north side. Um, so it considers 
all of the traffic that would be generated from the approximately two acres that remain R1, unchanged, um, the seven and a half approximate acres that would change to R2, and then the remaining 10 approximate acres that would change to C2. It, it considers all those things. Um, as part of the zone map amendment, uh, traffic study is not typically required, um, and that, that is referenced uh, by the traffic engineer in the uh, record uh, testimony before the EPC. And that is largely because uh, traffic generation is based on units and square footage of, of, of non-residential uses. And so uh, it's hard to predict with certainty at this level what the traffic impact would be. And so um, it's, it's ba the, the analysis now is based on build out of the zoning of what's possible. So it's not gonna be as accurate of a reflection of what could happen. Right, um, it's, it, it's, it, it's theoretical based on potential full build out under the proposed zoning. And then it, it, my understanding is that, that the comparison that was made, as, as we described, was, was M2 plus C1, uh, the traffic analysis w w was compared that to uh, C2 plus probably the maximum build out under R1 as presently zoned. And, and, uh, and the conclusion was, as I understand it, that it was slightly uh, slightly less under the proposed zoning is that mr. president that is correct what the study but the study wasn't required the study uh, would possibly be required under the EPC review however mr. president that's also correct okay so here's the complicated part the c2 part would go to EPC under this scenario but the r2 would not is that correct Mr. President, that is correct. Um, however, the um, level of development is what triggers the, the traffic study. So assuming that the R2 was having a measurable impact, um, you know, that would be required as part of the building permit process for the R2 as well, even though it wouldn't require a subsequent public hearing as the shopping center component would. Okay, but the R2 portion would, um the R2 portion, that would be a staff decision during its review, right? Because that normally would not go to our uh, EPC. Mr. President, that's correct. Okay. All right, counselors, any other questions? Counselor Davis? No. Uh, Counselor Jones. Thank you, Mr. President. This is an interesting project, and it's, it's one of those that we hope will turn out correctly and, and give us a, a, a better quality of life along this area as opposed to open fields, um, which we can't keep our city forever, uh, unfortunately, or fortunately as it were. So uh, I believe this is, I, I think this is a project that could, with the controls in place that we already have, uh, could end up with a very lovely project. It's like every time we change something, um, it's hard for the people surrounding it to appreciate it until after it's finished and they start shopping there or their mother lives there or their father lives there or, and then we realize what a great change it is. Change is difficult for all of us in every area of our lives, most especially when we've lived someplace with open space around us forever and we have to realize that we are not a farming community, that we are a city and um, sometimes things change. I think this is a great idea for a project for the what they're looking at and I appreciate the developers, the owners request and, and providing without being asked uh, an impact study on the, on the traffic study. That's very important. And I think it shows um, that this could be a good project for the area, should be a good project for the area. And therefore I will of course uh, support the motion in place. All right, thank you. Other comments or questions? Councilor Davis. Mr. President, I think I agree <clears throat> with Councilor Jones just in a little different light. I think the, your questions pointed to the fact that um, I think some of those big questions that need to be answered about traffic and others are better done in the next phase of this process, but really we ought to just take a look at whether um, this is an appropriate request for this land site given the change over 60 something years and, uh, and then allow the site plan and that process to continue forward where I think the mo some of the objections could be worked out. So. Uh, I'll be voting for it. I think the record's clear that they've followed those rules and there's a good reason for that that the LUHO found and so I'll be voting to accept it based on that and allow that process to work its way forward. Thank you. Uh, other comments, counselors? Um, quickly, just to, to reiterate uh, what Mr. Melendres and the, and the 
the report, the, the staff report and the uh, record um, indicate is that um, the, the present zoning of this dates back to the original zoning code, as far as I understand, 1959 preceding I-40. Uh, and I think that's pretty important to uh, keep that in mind. Um, for whatever reason at that time in 1959, it was decided, I guess, that this was appropriate industrial area. Uh, but I would say that, that we would never today place an industrial, and we've had a lot of discussion about that during the comprehensive plan uh, debate, a lot of discussion about, you know, why can't we fix some of these, these uh, areas that were zoned this way uh, uh, and not have industrial or high intensity zoning right next to R1, which is exactly what we've got here. So that is certainly a problem for any development. We, there would have to be some sort of uh, zone change here. The other aspect is normally when we're zoning such a thing or talking about it under the comp plan or the IDO that's being proposed or under current practice, we would have a, a transition and that's discussed in here as well, that we would have a transition from uh, uh, something like uh, a higher intensity, like, uh, like industrial, uh, the M zone, uh, to a single family residential, which we don't have here. We have an abrupt uh, immediate change from, from industrial to, to C1, which is problematic. So, I, I mean, I agree with Councilor Sanchez that it's somewhat complicated, uh, but the other arguments are or uh, compelling as well. All right, there is a motion and a second on this to approve uh, or, or to, um, to accept the uh, LUHO's recommendation and findings. Um, so if there's no further debate, we'll go ahead and, and vote on that matter. Uh, all those in favor say yes and raise your hand. Yes. yes. Opposed? No. And that passes on a seven to two vote. Um, we'll move to the next item. Is there a motion? Mr. President, I make the same motion. All right. Uh, there's on the next item to accept the legal recommendation. <clears throat> so on AC 17-8, there's a motion uh, to accept the LUHO's recommendation. Is there any discussion, specific discussion on AC 17-8? If not, all those in favor say yes and raise your hand. Yes. yes. Opposed? No. no. And that passes on a 7 to 2 vote. And uh, we'll move on to final actions. Um, and I think we're pretty close to the dinner break, so I think we'll go ahead and uh, do that before we hear the final actions. So uh, we'll re return in a, about a half an hour.